Welcome to the Freelance Tribe. Here we talk with skilled freelancers about their professional journey. Stay tuned for real life experiences to learn and actionable steps to take to improve your freelancing career. My name is Yuri. I'm a community builder at Code Control and Nanium.works. And my guest is Carolyn Vick, a social marketing and online community building expert who is hugely passionate about organic marketing tactics that build relationships and runs Bad X Enterprise business since 2015. So welcome, Carolyn. Hi, Yuri. Thanks for having me. Not a long time ago, we had a conversation about totally another topic. And here we are once again. And Bad X Enterprises. And you shared on LinkedIn, guess who was my first client? I'm bad in guessing game. So what was your first client? Well, I actually kind of got into business sort of accidentally. Um, my first client was a friend of mine who had a real estate uh, like career. Um, she was a realtor and she needed a lot of help. This was like you know, 2014, 2015, early ages of businesses really being serious about using social media. You know, like big corporations have kind of always figured out how to market themselves in online spaces, but smaller businesses being like, oh, maybe this makes sense. So she was in a really competitive market and advertising her listings online was really important to get the right mm -hmm. buyers in. And she was very frustrated with doing it. And I was like, I know how to use the internet. Um, I was actually pregnant at the time with our oldest. And I was like, how about this? Um, I will run your Facebook page and she had a really excellent garden. I was like, I can just come over and get stuff out of your garden. <laughs> and that was our, that was our exchange um, for several months. So listed her houses online, helped with the photos for them, did, you know, listing write-ups and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed the process not necessarily like the real estate side of it, but like learning about how to market things better. And then we were moving away and I was like, okay, like, obviously I can't come get stuff from your garden anymore. So that was fun. Bye. She's like, well, I'll pay you. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> uh, so that was March of 2015. I associated my business after we moved and got settled and, our son was a few months old and the rest is history. But yeah, real estate and later, many, many years later, I very briefly had a real estate license and <laughs> hated it. But yeah, realtor was my first client. And when you came up with naming, with Bad X, mm -hmm. when it like was? How, like, oh, um, so where we moved to was in wisconsin in a small little town outside of a bigger town there's an area that when my husband and i were even dating we would go with friends to visit these friends of his their family had like a cabin up there and it was a really really pretty area that i felt very strongly attached to it was beautiful hills i grew up in a really flat area in the midwest mm. like a lot of hills and stuff um and this area was actually getting a really long nerdy answer for this this area was actually part of a glacial exclusion if you're a geologist you understand that so like glaciers <laughs> didn't go there so it didn't cut down the hills so there's a lot of like really interesting geology and stuff one of those interesting things is the deep valleys that are kind of like norway not as big as the fjords but like mini fjords um, and little rivers that go mm. in the bottom of the of the valleys. And that is how I got my name is one of those rivers, the Bad Axe River. And I love that little river. And that whole area just had like a really magnetic pull for a lot of people. Just like it's beautiful. Lots of people love the area. And actually, I, now that I'm thinking about it, I also named my my other my textile artist handle is named after that area, too. So. I no longer live there, but I live in the southern tip of that glacial exclusion area in the Midwest. So still in the drift lists, but yeah, it's named after a river, but I didn't know what I wanted my business to be when I set it up, but I wanted a name 
that I could just make anything up. Like that could be anything. Bad Axe Enterprises. It's not Carolyn's marketing company. It could be anything. <laughs> Very non-committal, but I also wanted it to be memorable, like something that people would be like, "Oh, it's kind of like that." Sounds like something else. <laughs> and it's really interesting because it sounds like very, very similar to badass. Mm-hmm. Bad- yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking. About, which is yeah. really nice, you know. It's interesting, and yeah, thank you very much for this story. And you shared some time ago that's exactly why we started this conversation because i wanted to learn more from you so you shared some advice which you wished someone had given you back in 2015. so -hmm. let's go through your through them and first was trust yourself and you wrote that if you don't trust yourself you are going to get taken advantage of what is your recipe for trusting yourself well early on a lot of the work I was doing, right? I didn't, there was no college degree for social media when I was starting out. I mean, now I found out that there are and that just cracks me up, but (laughs) there wasn't a degree, right? So it's like, you know, on whose authority do you know these things? So a lot of the work, even if you have a degree in social media or marketing, a lot of your work is experimental and like you're learning. So I started with knowing literally nothing and being very upfront with that with my clients. Cause I did not want to tell someone, yeah, I know how to do that. And then they come to find out that like, I am learning, I'm Googling how to do this as they're paying me. <laughs> so I was always, you know, very upfront with them. Like, yeah, I will build your website. I will find a way to do it. I don't know how to build a website right now, but we're going to learn together. And luckily most people were very, okay with that. So with that, I really learned very quickly that I had to trust myself to find a way to do things that I didn't know how to do. That was very helpful for myself. That was a good piece of my recipe of trusting myself. The other piece is the more times you figure out something that's super confusing and complex, especially with, I was doing a lot more website building in my early days. There's weird things that happen when you're making a website or or launching it or things like that, you know, nine times out of 10, it goes really smoothly, but those, that other 10%, (laughs) that like little segment of problematic websites taught me so much more because like I was able to overcome those problems. So taking on challenges, being transparent that they are challenges, and then really celebrating yourself when you you figured it out with the help of the internet and Google and YouTube, but you did it. That's helped me trust myself a lot. It sounds so easy, you know, but <laughs> nah. yeah, I, I totally understand it. It's not that easy. No, it's not. And I mean, like even now, right. It's been, it's been a long time that I've been in business. I mean, relatively long time. There's so many moments still where I'm like, okay, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to find it out. Or I'm like, oh, there's people who have been doing it more, better, different, right? That comparison thing. Mm -hmm. Being realistic with yourself was like, okay, I maybe don't know how to do it the way they do, but I know how I would do it. And that is a solution. It might not be the right solution for everyone, but it's a solution that people will pay me for. Like, it always helps when you have, you know, you're not just starting out and you're like, I don't know if anyone's going to pay me. That's terrifying, right? Oh, yeah. But building that trust over time in the beginning, there's a level of blind trust. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So second one, you told that if you are saying no to an opportunity, you know, is a bad fit. You don't need to explain why. But once again, sometimes opportunity are coming. And especially yeah. if you are a freelancer, sometimes you have a lot of opportunities, sometimes you have zero opportunities. And how do you know that it's a bad fit? So this is something that I've learned over time, right? Like there's obvious red flags, you know, kind of if you're in a conversation with somebody and they're talking about mistreating other contractors, I've literally had that happen in mm. like introduction calls with people. Where they're like, oh, I hired someone to do this and they did terribly, so I refused to pay them or, you know, whatever. Like, even if that's true, right? Like, even if that other vendor, contractor, whatever was 
didn't do the work, if this person's like bragging to you about not paying, that's a red flag, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but other things, right? Like knowing it's not a good fit. One thing that I so set it up, not fully realizing how beneficial it would be. I used um, a software HoneyBook to make mm -hmm. an inquiry form on my website. So that inquiry form, if people select like when I was doing more website builds or more direct social media management, those were two options that I set up. It would automatically email them the questionnaire of like all the basic questions that I would ask mm -hmm. in email, like, do you have a Twitter? Do you have a TikTok? Do you want a Twitter? You know, like it's not super long, but it takes a little bit of time to go through, you know, maybe five or 10 minutes, depending on if you're very familiar with your own brand's marketing or not. So I have that, that questionnaire goes out as soon as someone fills out an inquiry form. The inquiry form has some details, but the questionnaire is really detailed. Mm -hmm. If they cannot even send me back the questionnaire, I am not going to ever chase them ever. <laughs> like, may, I mean, there's like one time because it was somebody I'd had a human conversation with and I'd sent them like, go to my website, fill out this, you'll get a questionnaire and fill it out. And they were kind of dragging their feet on it. I was like, but we had already talked in person. So I kind of knew the situation. That is the one time I've kind of chased someone down for a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. The rest of that, I'm like, if you can't take the time, five, 10 minutes to get me some answers, even if you don't know all the answers, just open it, fill it out, resubmit it to me. If you can't do that, that's been such a great vetting tool. Like, <laughs> highly recommend. Yeah, it's it's really helpful. And I can say it from just personal conversation when somebody is like DMing with some questions and then you just asking them additional questions. Mm, in 90% they're disappearing. Yeah. yeah. It's a yep. great filter. Mm -hmm. Then you wrote, get paid a non-refundable retainer upfront for all projects. It's yeah. good when you trust yourself. Exactly. Yeah. But how do you explain to clients why they have to pay you upfront? And it's it depends on the type of work I'm doing. Sometimes there are situations where I will alter that. Mm -hmm. But for I would say eighty to ninety percent of projects, for like first time client, I'm gonna say like this is the first time I've worked with someone. I'm going to require some or all of the cost upfront. And the way I explain it to them is like, you pay up front when you go to a movie, concert, any of those things, right? You pay before you get a massage, before you get into the car wash, like any service, right? Most of the time you're going to pay up front for mm. a lot of the services. The other reason that I explain, and I write these out in my contracts, I have yet to have anyone question that I need an amount of payment up front. Sometimes they've questioned if it could be less. I have had people say, can I just pay you everything up front? That's happened more often than people asking to pay less up front, which is great because for whatever reason, they're like, I just want it done. <laughs> Good for me. <laughs> but a lot of times um, it's written out. It's always written out in the contract. And I explain I am doing for most of my clients a significant amount of research before community management starts or before they're going to see posts on their social media page or anything mm -hmm. like that. So before the like more visible work that I do, there's so much that happens in the background and those hours need to be paid for as well. So that's, you know, takes time to write up contracts to start doing the audience research, the social audit. If I'm taking over people's social media accounts, I need to see what they've done in the past. And that takes time if you have an existing presence. So I've really, because those, the people that are going to complain, they don't fill out the questionnaire. So I don't deal with that. <laughs> there yeah. have been times where, you know, people have like, can we pay a little bit less upfront depending? I'm somewhat flexible on that, but yeah, there needs to be an amount. Cause like, then you can go through my payment processing system. You can see if you have problems with it or if you need to work with your bank to get, you know, get me payment. And it shows trust for both sides, right? Like that's like 
for me on my end, I'm like, I have some of their money. Not that I'm ever going to flake on it. Like, I need to deliver something quick, like something first. So they, you know, they've already paid. We need to like fulfill part of this agreement right away. Yeah, I also feel that it's an additional motivation factor. And uh, yeah, I totally get it. And <laughs> I wonder, well, so basically you went this journey from 2015 to 2000s, let's say 24s already. Mm -hmm. And what were the main milestones of building BetX Enterprise? Um, a series of interesting opportunities that resulted in i honestly it's like one of those things reflecting on mm -hmm. the business that i've built it's so funny because like as the things were happening it's like i spent a really long time in the early days of my business pretending i didn't have a business and i don't regret that because i feel like i learned a lot in a lower stakes environment I wasn't working full time before I was home with the kids, which was amazing. And it was something that, you know, my husband and I had both discussed. We wanted mm -hmm. talked about this for forever. Whichever one of us could make the most money would work. And then the other one would stay with the kids, which we did for years. And I kind of had this as just like, I thought it would be fun to pay our internet bill, right? Like that was my big dream, which was <laughs> very easy to do. It was not expensive. And then from there, I was like, oh, I'm making, you know, like friends, family would find out like, oh, Carolyn can build websites or Carolyn can teach me how to use Facebook for my business or Carolyn can manage my Instagram page. So people like started finding out and I was like, okay, started getting some more income. I was like, okay, so I need to like buy items now for my business so I don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> so like, you know, I bought a refurbished laptop. I bought a drone, started using that for, you know, photography, for event photography and stuff. And for some of my clients were real estate agents when we were living in Wisconsin and go take drone photos for their listings. And so I think that milestone of like, I suddenly realized that like this was a, an actual business and I went to set up a business bank account. So that was like my first being like, oh, like I, I registered the business in 2015 and then it's probably like two or three years later, I was like, Oh, <laughs> this is a real business. Um, so I got myself a bank account and at that same time, simultaneously co-founded a yarn shop with a friend. So I was running a retail business and doing all of my bad act stuff and having two kids, which was, it was all super fun. Like, it was amazing. I then got pursued and hired by our small town bank where I was trying to get my bank account. <laughs> they're like, we don't have a director of marketing. And I was like, okay. And they're like, would you like to do that? So that was like the next milestone. I did work there for about a year. And I was like, okay, I actually do know what I'm doing. Like, right. Like I was able to go through compliance because financial institutions have to have very compliant advertising, learned a lot about print ads, radio ads, TV ads, all that stuff. And I was like, this is silly that I'm not doing this for my business, that I'm like working hours. So I quit that and it was, it kept growing. So that was like my next milestone was like being like, okay, going from bad acts being just for fun to being like, okay, it's a little more serious to having a, a corporate entity be like, no, this is very serious. <laughs> it's like, that's weird. So then from that, it was like in the back of my head, I was like, I wonder if this could actually pay for all our bills. And in 2018 ish, it started being like, you could quit your job to my <laughs> husband. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and you know it was like there's there'd be like months where it's like oh yeah you could absolutely quit your job and then there'd be a month where it'd be nothing and i'm like mm. please do not quit your job. <laughs> but that next milestone of being like very very comfortable 
and feeling like financially stable, that it was like, this could be our full-time income that happened in 2019, right before mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. And so bad X was our full-time income. And then COVID happened and, you know, everybody had that panic of like, everything's going to fall apart. And I mean, right. Like <laughs> to a degree, but funny enough, everybody needed a website to be on social media and the internet. And so I was in high demand, which was great. And the rest has been just really lovely. So that was like it being our full-time income, COVID happening, and then building out into the community industry. Those are my most recent milestones, but it's more like a self-evolution more than business milestones, I guess. <laughs> and you know, it's fun. It sounds very organic. And yeah. I wonder... If you were starting again right now, would you change anything? No, I mean, there's a couple things. There's like, I think there's a few times where I worked with people that I shouldn't have, that even though those are like great learning experiences, I would love to not have cried that much. <laughs> like, there's a few situations where I'm like, I could have done without that education like i could have done without those tears but really a lot of it i think it's landed me in the right place at the right time so many times that even if i'm like oh i should have taken myself seriously sooner it's everything's happened for a reason so far so i'm not i don't want to mess with the the recipe's good so far so even if it's weird how it's working out it's going well <laughs> Got it. Let's not mess it with it, definitely. And you know, Carolyn, I really wish to have the sky as a limit, but time is a limit. So the final question, what is your favorite food? My favorite food? Oh, I love tacos. I do. I love them so much. Got it. You know, Carolyn, thank you very much for sharing your professional journey. And it's such a pleasure to hear and learn from you. Thanks, Yuri. It's such a pleasure to chat with you. You always have the best questions. And thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, hit the like button on five stars and share it with your friend. That's it. We're done. See you in the next episode.